the chords echo from concert halls and front porches, through Appalachian hollows and big city bars. Romantic, lonely, laughing and lively. The handmade American acoustic guitar is one of the most highly prized musical instruments in the world. And it's more than just wood and wire. It's craftsmanship and attitude. The guitar represents freedom. It represents independence. It represents rebellion sometimes. American guitar builders trace their roots back to Europe of the early 1800s, where the craft of Luthery, that's guitar building, was emerging as the modern guitar evolved. There's no exact count of how many luthiers there are in America, but they number in the thousands, each in pursuit of their own perfect guitar. The idea that I and my partners can take a raw stack of wood and make something that is so aesthetically pleasing to the eye and the ear, uh, that's, there's nothing like it. There's nothing like it. It's preserving a bit of craftsmanship that is really a vanishing art in this country. 20 years ago or 15 years ago, it seems like when they asked me what I did, I'd say, well, I make guitars. I said, oh, well, what do you do for a living? <laughs> and I'd say, well, I make guitars. I couldn't imagine a, a, a more right livelihood. You know, it seemed to fit really nicely into my philosophies and, and what I'd like to do. Well, I even enjoy sanding. And nobody would ever admit that. I, I don't mind sanding at all. I, I'm gone, that's probably why. I don't think about what I'm doing half the time. I just daydream, I'm a daydreamer. So it's easy for me to get through 10 hours and not know what I did, except see the finished product. To make an entire guitar, is, it's, a, it's a, quite an ordeal. It, today, there's over 300 operations involved, and it takes a minimum of three months. Every luthier, whether they admit it or not, is an absolute perfectionist, taking as much care with the unseen details as with the final polish. The materials, the glues, the, the machinery that assists you in building the guitars have gotten better so that we really are turning out a much more precision instrument now. Well, to make the sound or make the feel or make anything you want in that guitar, you have to be as exact as you can in the process of doing it. You can't, there's no, there's no way you can randomly end up with that guitar. No, I, I am very, very fussy. I'm picky and I guess we all are. You have to be. Um, but I wouldn't make an instrument, find flaw in it, and then disassemble it and try to improve on that instrument over and over and over again until that particular guitar were perfect. If I find flaw in an instrument and there's always something, I'll ship it out and try to do better the next time. Guitars have been made from just about every kind of wood there is, and the experienced builder will select a particular piece of wood for the tone it will give the guitar. Each of the different kinds of wood has its own quality, but even within a specific kind of wood, Every guitar is going to be unique. Whether it's rosewood, mahogany, maple, or walnut, every guitar begins as a dream. So the, the hard part now becomes to take this area or this idea that you want this guitar to sound like and put numbers on it. In other words, process this wood, manufacture it, whittle it down, get rid of all the excess wood and leave the guitar. And it's, it's such a close thing. There are so many variables that go in to the sound of an instrument. You know, and everything has to kind of work together to produce a particular sound. That it's hard to ask like one little thing here and one little thing there. And I think if a person's doing that, he, you know, he's headed down the wrong path. Every luthier has their own idea of how to make that guitar sound the best. The best that, that we individually know, know how. We may not always agree, 
we often learn that the mass or someone might like something different than what we do, and we go, hmm, I understand, and, and change it. We're not making a guitar for everybody. There's so many sounds of a guitar you could have, and, and ours is only one of them. I've been fortunate because my guitars are consistent. I get orders from people that have either seen or played or heard my guitars. So they order a guitar from me expecting it to look and sound and feel a certain way. Um, I rarely have people call with questions about the sound or, or the feel or the look or anything else. They, and they're pretty much traditional mainstream players, so it's been very easy for me. I haven't had to be diverse. I make the arch top jazz guitar for the arch top mainstream jazz player, and that's all I've ever done. It's been very, very easy. It's my little niche. I don't sit out and write down all my time, you know, and I'd probably freak out if I did, you know. But uh, it's there's so many hours involved, and everyone's different. You, you might spend more time on the one you're working on now than the next one. A lot of today's guitar builders were a part of the 60s generation, when there was a great rebirth of handcrafts. What those people realized uh, in, the, in the 1970s was that it's a very tough business to learn and a very tough business to succeed at. Most people had, had very poor business skills and, and floundered. But uh, what's, what's happened is, as those people have, have gotten a little older and, and approached their, their 40s. They've all matured at once. And um, they've matured in their business skills, they've matured in their craftsmanship and in their designs. And I think that's uh, probably one of the major factors, w why there's such an abundance of, uh, of excellence in, in this field. What builders have found is the satisfaction of supporting themselves with a job they love. Some are musicians, some are drawn to the romance of old world craftsmanship and to the freedom and struggle of self-employment. I like the money myself. <laughs> I like the lifestyle, I really do. I, I make my own hours, I work seven days a week, day and night, and I love every minute of it. But I also like the money. Yeah, you're darn right. <laughs> After probably 15 years or about that, first 15 years was a struggle. Hot and cold, up and down, doing lots of repairs to fill in the gaps. And uh, I used to teach and I would do anything, change strings on a student grade instrument, whatever it took to make a living. Uh, but until eventually the, the orders became regular, steady, consistent. I grew up working in the shop making toys and my father made furniture, you know, in the 30s and started then and, and it's always kind of been a part of me and for me, it's almost more of a way of life than it is a business. I think putting more than 100 instruments out in your lifetime is substantial. It probably is not enough to earn a living on. A very, very good maker that puts out 15 to 20 instruments a year is going to be making a, f a reasonably good living uh, as an individual. And there's not too many of them. There's probably uh, two or three hundred of those people. And naturally, there's a, a small group of them that really are very, very good and very, very successful. Builders love to see their guitars being played, and not just for monetary reasons. There's a strong bond of loyalty between musicians and luthiers. Being on a first-name basis with the person who built your guitar adds to the experience. And we've had people, you know, come from as far as way as Germany, you know, just specifically to pick up their guitar for them. Uh, and we've had people to, uh, you know, come from California or this place and that place so that they can personally place the order. It's, I think, you know, it's that type of personal involvement in what we're doing that is appealing to a lot of people and makes the business for us very enjoyable. This kind of all ties back to, to the individual wood grains and everything else, you know. This is mine, this is unique, there's not another one like it, and it's got its own sound. Now there's some other ones out there that are, that are very similar, you know, but this is mine, and I've got the only one. 
for the guitar to produce sound, the, the top needs to vibrate and literally pump, pump air out the sound hole. And, and uh, the more the top vibrates, the, uh, uh, in general, the, the, the more projective and louder and, and better and richer the sound. Uh, it, it's a difficult thing uh, to uh, counteract the more than 100 pounds of tension that's exerted on the, on the top. And in order, order to do that, you have to make some compromises and you have to put braces in. The thing about Martin is that Martin invented a, a, a system of bracing called the X-Brace, which, um, which yields the most amount of strength for the least amount of wood. And the X-Brace uh, was so successful that virtually every acoustic guitar manufacturer in the world uses it. C.F. Martin can rightly be called the father of the American acoustic guitar. Martin pioneered design changes that made the guitar a uniquely American instrument. These, in a sense, are the true American guitars. The first real, honest-to-goodness American guitars that are distinctly different structurally and ornamentally from any European instruments that preceded them or even from European instruments that followed them. The 1800s was the era of the parlor guitar. The guitar wasn't taken seriously as a professional performance instrument. Um, there were mail order guitars sold through the Sears catalog and when you look through those catalogs it's charming and delightful because you see styles of guitars and ornamentation on guitars which are common to a lot of the makers of the 1800s. Martin and Washburn and, and Bruno and a, any number of, of tiny independent makers whose names unfortunately didn't always carry through to the 20th century were on the market at that time. Orville Gibson was an eccentric woodcarver and turn-of-the-century visionary. Taking inspiration from violin design, Orville carved his instruments instead of simply using flat boards and so evolved the second American guitar. He was the first person that we think of who's known as the uh, father of the arch top or carved top guitar. Um, after his company was formed around 1902, he continued as a, essentially a consultant and a designer and engineer for them, but his influence on the company began to wane shortly after that. I think Orville would not have gone on to really be a famous maker had not the Gibson Company evolved his designs. He sold his patent in 1902 to a group of Kalamazoo investors who set up the Gibson Company. He was a consultant and the man who sold the patent. In the early 20s, Lloyd Lord started working for Gibson, and he brought the F-holes to the mandolin family, which enhanced the whole sound. What was significant about the L5 guitar was that it was the first uh, production carved top guitar with the F-shaped sound holes like you find on a violin top, as opposed to the oval or round hole that had been used before. Um, this guitar very quickly became accepted as an alternative one to flat top guitars or these oval hole uh, carved top guitars for use in orchestras. And also that guitar came into being about the time that uh, of course there was a considerable interest in the mandolin orchestras. So that guitar became kind of an accompaniment or a rhythm part of those orchestras. And when the guitar was beginning to uh, move into the, uh, the big bands, you know, at that point later on, you know, eventually displacing the banjo and other types of stringed instruments as a, as a rhythm instrument. It was found that the carved top F-hole guitar, of which the Gibson L5 uh, was essentially the first, uh, could project uh, an unamplified tone and volume over the sound of the horns and, and all the percussion in these big bands. The player never really hears what he's doing. <laughs> he never hears what the voice of the instrument is, the, the, the ideal location uh, to listen to an archtop is maybe six or eight feet in front of it. 
uh, but when you're playing it, you're, you're hearing and feeling the instrument, but not like the listener is standing out front. It's made and designed to project, that's why. Unlike the, uh, the old round hole flat top, which the player hears right away. Today, arch tops are played as lead voices, but originally they were rhythm instruments made to project their sound across a room. These elegant instruments have always taken longer to build than other guitars because of the tedious process of carving away the curve of the top and back. The names D'Angelico, Stromberg, Gibson, and Lohr are spoken in reverent tones, while today's arch top builders continue to refine the standard. See, that, that pitch will drop as I remove wood. It will drop and drop and drop until it's where I think it should be. Then I'll cut the F holes. It'll drop quite a bit then. I'll then glue on the braces. The pitch will then raise back up again. Then I'll shave the braces and the pitch will drop again. By that, at that point, it's pretty much where it should be. You're fine tuning it at that point. It's going up and down and up and down until finally it's where it should be. Not necessarily tuned to a specific pitch. It's whatever pitch is good for that particular board. John Dopiera imagined a guitar that didn't use wood to produce sound. Dopiera and his brothers began making guitars with metal resonator cones in the mid-1920s. They were the loudest thing around before electric guitars. The Dopera company name, Dobro, has become the common name for resonator guitars. In the early 1920s, the guitars were still fairly small bodied, very balanced sounding, 12 fret neck, wide fingerboard, flat fingerboard. People didn't seem to mind that. They liked the fact that they had steel strings. Virtually all guitars made before 1900 use gut strings. But after the turn of the century, builders such as Gibson and the Larson Brothers of Chicago were building guitars with steel strings, which make the guitar louder. In the late 1920s, Martin received an order for a custom guitar, one with a long, slender neck. The resulting guitar had a profound effect on flat top acoustic design. They took the 12 fret triple O sized Martin guitar and squared off the shoulders at the top and attached the neck at the 14th fret. This was a major achievement in guitar making. It changed the way people could use the instrument and enabled the guitar to be used in a much wider sense. American music was changing in the early 20th century. Rural folk music evolved into country, bluegrass, and blues. Jazz was developing. The guitar was everywhere. Radio shows, dance halls, even the movies. Probably the quintessential acoustic guitar for my generation is the Martin D28. Using a pattern developed around 1916, the Martin Company issued a large pear-shaped guitar in 1931, naming it for the largest class of battleship of the day, the Dreadnought. It started out real slow and uh, didn't sell all that many in the early days. Uh, I think in the 40s, really, when, uh, when people started uh, performing, on stage and, and needing more volume and bigger size instruments is when the dreadnoughts started catching on. When people um, saw their favorite singers, whether they were on the Grand Ole Opry or uh, Elvis Presley and Ed Sullivan uh, playing dreadnought guitars, suddenly it became the instrument of choice for singer-songwriters. And you really can't uh, underestimate the importance uh, from, a, from a commercial standpoint of seeing a guitar in the hands of a particular person at a particular moment. I think that's had as much to do with the rise of particular designs and the popularity of particular designs as any other single factor. It's 
sound without feel isn't anything. It's sterile, you know. You have to have sound, feel. So all your senses have to be involved. Weight, balance. There's, it's limitless, you know. And those, those great guitars seem to have them all. Uh, there's something about old guitars. I, I think there's a quality of the tone on an aged guitar and a guitar that's been played a lot that you can't quite, you definitely can't get on a brand new one. J.W. Gallagher once told me, I knew him, uh, built the Gallagher guitars, he was a friend of mine, and uh, years ago he told me, he said, well, Norm, he says, if we could just take a, a, a needle, you know, and shoot 50, 60 years of age into one of these things, we'd be getting somewhere, but that's the one thing that we can't do. is uh, the physicist's view, where you take an oscilloscope and other high-tech gear, and you try to find two guitars that are otherwise identical, except one is 30 years older than the other, and you play and you try to find out what the sonic characteristics might be. But I think there's, in fact, precious little of that kind of um, highly technical or scientific uh, basis to what a lot of people think about guitars. I think there is a lot of mystery. I think there's a lot of voodoo. I think there's a lot of uh, romance. I believe uh, sometimes age is overrated. I think that a guitar that's going to be good is really quite good from the very beginning. On a bad instrument, age isn't going to do any good at all. <laughs> if the instrument was made right to begin with, it'll get better with age. Good instruments certainly will improve with age, but it's a subtle improvement. If they're not good when they're two weeks old, I'm darned if I want to sit around trying to bang sound into a guitar for 10 years hoping it's going to get good. What we're trying to do is to quantify what we do, um, understand uh, more and more through experience how to voice guitars and tune them, and come up with uh, um, better sustain, uh, better resonance, and um, uh, a nice variety for different styles of playing. I think we're enjoying probably uh, a real golden era in steel string guitar building right now. I think that we are evolving, you know, past the point of the fine instruments of the 30s. I say you give some of the guitars that are around today 50 years that are being built today, you give them 50 years of hard playing and uh, they're going to be right up there with any of the old ones. In some, some ways, they're better. We don't know how the great guitars that are being built today are going to sound in 30 years. We're going to have to wait 30 years to find out. Guitars of the future may be very different. New materials will someday replace traditional woods as forest burn or are cut down wholesale to make disposable products. The resources that are used to build guitars, which is to say wood, uh, those are finite resources. There's no question that we are running out of some of them and have effectively run out of some of them. I think what remains to be seen is the willingness of up-and-coming players and future players to try materials that uh, are alternatives to what we consider traditional guitar building materials. I do think uh, for the sake of our natural resources, we need to explore alternates to rosewood, alternates to maple, spruce, and, and we are exploring them, and I think it's inevitable. I, I don't think we have much choice. For so long, guitars, not just Martin guitars, but guitars have been made out of rosewood and mahogany and ebony and spruce, that that's what people expect and that's what they think that's all they can be made of. And that is not the case. And I'm afraid what's going to have to happen is that there's going to have to be a wood crisis. And then people are going to open up and say, okay, I'll accept alternatives. You think of the guitar, you think of, uh, of change, excitement, uh, revolution. Uh, you know, rocking the boat and all that sort of stuff and yet isn't it interesting that guitar players are often the last people on earth to embrace change when it comes to their own instruments 
but that's sometimes the case. And I think it's because if a kid has grown up uh, always wanting a, a Rosewood D45, and uh, uh, you know now he's a lawyer and he can finally afford one, by God, he's going to get a Rosewood D45. Or if he's going to have a guitar built, by God, it's going to be made out of uh, Brazilian rosewood because that's what he grew up wanting, and uh, now he's going to get it. And he doesn't want to hear about something uh, less romantic. If you look at all of the wood that all of us who build guitars use, it's not a lot of wood. But those woods that we use are used for other products. And those other products consume a lot of wood. And because of man's position right now on Earth of, well, I better get it today because if I don't get it today, someone else will get it tomorrow, we are not being real judicious with these precious raw materials. Instrument quality spruce goes into um, the household products that we use all the time, paper towels, uh, newspaper, on and on. It's uh, senseless to waste tons and tons and tons of wood on chopsticks, millions of tons of wood on chopsticks that are just discarded. Uh, the paper industry utilizes an incredible amount of wood. Um, spruce is, is the I pretty much the ideal, the optimum wood for nice white paper. It doesn't require a lot of bleaching. And, and uh, so they, they often cut young growth spruce, trees which would eventually become guitar wood. I think we'll see a lot more uh, synthetic materials. Um, I think that we'll see a lot of alternative woods, woods that are sustainable yield. Guitars are more personal, I think. Even a factory instrument, there's something about a guitar, for me anyway. And guitar players are a, um, a breed that has not yet been fitted into a mold. You can't hold them down. They're one, I mean, nobody agrees on how they should be made. and and. and and the players all disagree on how they should be played. Anything goes on the guitar, you know. If, if you do it good, I think most anything goes, from rock and roll to, to any kind of hillbilly music. Different guitars definitely inspire different ideas in terms of the uh, composition and also just how you would play, how you would solo, and how you express yourself. They give you different potential to work with. The acoustic guitar didn't originate in America but its design has been so radically modified here and the way Americans play so different that it's become a cultural icon.